What's up, homies? So, I thought I'd do a video of me making one of these rivet lock. I mean, sorry, one of these uh, um, HMK scalpel V3s. I've made, in terms of V1, V2, V3, almost like 500 of these now. And uh, the V2 basically completely sold out. We sold like almost like 200 plus of those, so that was pretty sick. Actually, it was more than that. It was like 250. Um, it was an enormous amount of them, and now uh, I've moved on to V3. And uh, V3 is kind of just all the improvements over uh, the V2 V2 design. I don't think I have... Yeah, here's the V3. So I added shoulders there. So the blade is slightly taller. <clears throat> and then I made the choil, that little hole there, a little bit smaller too. Uh, so that's really the main difference, and that allows all the handles to start in the exact same spot. With the previous, the V2, you see there was nothing there, so the handles were all starting plus minus a tenth of a millimeter or something away from each other, so there was a little bit of inconsistency there, and it was also extremely difficult to grind, uh, freehand grind this uh, Scandi grind that you see there on this... Um, very very narrow little blade here so yeah if you want to support my work you can go ahead and uh buy one of these from my website or from etsy and uh let's get to it so right now i'm just filling up the water container you see right here and that goes on top of the belt like that and then uh when we turn it on we get our water cooling. So I'm just waiting for the thing to fill up. And uh, also, I don't know if you can see, but that's our, the whole thing is built on a container. And then uh, it's actually, um, it gets emptied out. There's a pump to empty it out. So the first thing I'm gonna do, these are already hardened. And the first thing I'm going to do is chamfer all the sides of the handle, right? This part. I don't. I leave the blade untouched, and uh, that's the water is full. You see, we got a bit of a leaking problem there. I gotta fix that at some point. Oh well. Oh well. Anyway, it's freezing cold water, but you need the water cooling if you're going to grind. Uh, Scandi grinds like this um, Just overall it's it's much more professional to grind with water cooling So let me get my jacket on and we'll start Got my water jacket on you see it's the other way around the water comes up so I have a hood on this side and uh, Let's get grinding
so now I've gotten the grind pretty much done. Um, I'm gonna do the spine, and by polishing the spine, we're also removing the burrs that are formed on the tip. Pretty good, huh? So there's a nice fat fur on the edge here, which is a sign that it's sharp uh, under the fur. And now I have a 10,000 grit, a very hard 10,000 grit stone, and I remove the burrs on there. I keep the blade very, very steep on the stone. And this uh, helps in two ways. It helps sort of remove uh, the burr. But it also, under a microscope, makes the edge look a lot cleaner. So, you could call it a micro bevel. like that and then what you do when you want to get rid of burrs you go on one side a little bit move all the burrs onto the one side and then you can cut them off like that we're gonna go on the buffing machine next to clean everything up but this is just a nice quick way to get rid of um, the, the bond that the burrs have against the stone. I got a lot of water in here, but not easily accessible. It's, it's a bit, I have to bend over to get that rock. So I've only just started doing this with um, the scalpels. The first uh, batch I didn't. Like the V2s, I didn't really do this to. Um, I didn't really do it to my own either. It's not all that necessary. Um, but I found that I, I think it, it makes it sharper. And uh, I think it actually does have an impact uh, on the performance uh, in a good way. So uh, I think you get just a smoother cut. Now the thing why 10,000 grit is because when you have so little metal on the edge like that, when you have just so little metal, anything lower than that really doesn't work. Um, but yeah, this just ensures a lot of things and uh, you really don't see it at all. It's microscopic but uh, you just get a 10,000 grit leading edge there like that. And voila, now we can go back and forth. This, when you sharpen forwards like this, you don't get so many burrs. This is how uh, razor blades used to be sharpened. A lot of people, they go backwards like this, but you just get insane burrs. And actually, if you um, look into it long enough, you'll, you'll find in places that burrs actually, they make the edge weak. So you, you wanna avoid burrs. Oh, this is good. All right. When you sharpen your own scalpel, I recommend you just do this. 
do a 10,000 grit on the leading edge. Um, the bevels, so the way you should do it is you get a coarse stone and uh, the, the, um, the scandy grind itself you do on a coarse stone until you get a burr. So you sharpen it down all the way. Once you get that burr, then you get your 10,000 grit stone and you do what I'm doing here, oops, um, which is like this. You remove those burrs and then put an edge like that and then uh, strop it. You don't have to do it for as long as I'm doing it here. But the nice thing is you get, um, you also, you get more edge retention like this. You're not sacrificing the sharpness uh, at all. In fact, this gets sharper. And um, the, smooth of the, the smoothness of the cut is also uh, dramatically increased. Just gotta get some of that groundwater there. See, we're just getting rid of that burr. Because you do get a pretty fat burr forming. Yeah, so next thing is, once we're done with these, is we go over to the buffing machine. And uh, I'll see you there. All right. You want a small wheel, you also want glasses, because this shit spits into your eyes. And what we got is a very high quality, the highest quality I could find from Germany, black paste. Uh, it's very, very coarse paste. And this is my industrial buffing machine from the Fiskers factory. So this thing has been buffing blades for, uh, you know, a long ass time. And it's got two speeds. I put on slow speed, but here's the fast speed. Pretty, pretty impressive, but we don't go fast with these blades. We don't want to. The thing with the high quality paste is that it keeps the metal cool. So, I'm going to reset the camera because it's vibrating on the machine. So, just a second.
The next thing is to cut ourselves a stretch of string, which will make the handle wrap. So you can see it's a full length. I got a little bit of from wetness from the grinder there. Uh, and then to burn the tips like that, as you can see. Uh, you want to turn them into little needles so they're easier to push through the uh, end of that. And we do that, of course, by getting our good old power cord. Cut it full arm's length. And then you remove the internals. I have the already pre-flattened power cord on the shelf where the guts have been emptied. It's, it's, gut, it's called gutted power cord or something. But these are too small for that. Too, these are too small. The, par, the scalpels are too narrow and too small for the gutted power cord to work, right? And the reason for that is when you're going around, the flat one has already a predetermined shape. So you can't just squeeze it flat wherever you want. So because these are hollow round, you can squeeze it wherever you want and force it to conform however you want, whenever you want. Those, it's a bit more tricky. It's fine on larger handles and larger knives, but when it's this small, you have to get the regular power cord and empty out all the stuff and then uh, burn the tips. I need to find my lighter. So we got our string. I get my kisaki, tap the ends off. I don't know where my actual lighter for this is, so I had to use this one. This one's not as reliable as the other one that I have. Uh, you see, it's already, yeah, whatever. And then from here, generally what you do is you just sit down for like two or three hours and do as many of these in one go and get a stack of these done. What I like about the power cord, of course, is that um, it's kind of like my version of injection molding. Oh. Yeah, this thing never fucking works, I swear to God. I'll be back. All right. It's funny with these lighters. Um, I started collecting them a while back, like a couple years ago. I just sort of randomly order and buy um, these torch lighters. I don't know, I just got kind of addicted to them. They're awesome. But it's funny how I like the price does not mean, when it comes to these kind of lighters, the price does not mean quality. This is the cheapest one I've ever bought for two bucks and it's the only one that's continued working ever since. I mean, the lid fell off and all this kind of stuff. This one, they were 10 bucks each from a cigar store. They never even properly work. They work day one, I just can't get them to ever work properly or for long periods of time. And uh, it's funny, I have 30 euro ones, 50 euro ones, and this one's just uh, the only one that hasn't uh, given up on me. It fills up easy, so just because something's expensive doesn't mean it's good, you know. I'm really surprised, actually, how good this one is. You can actually also see how used up it is. So, there we have it. So, now we got two strings like that. So here we've got our shrink tubes. And I have a drawn here like a 90 degree thing that lets me clean off the side that's been sliced cut so that it's like as close to 90 degrees as we can get it I gotta figure out a better system for that um, 
because it's nice when it's nice and flush, of course. Makes it easier. There we go. These Kisakis are super useful for making these knives. So now we've got this. Make sure I got the correct side. And you see, then you want to pinch it. Got this is the, the got a trusty heat gun. Oh. I want to make sure that it's right up there. I didn't get it like 90 degree enough, but I have to fiddle around with it a little bit. Yeah, I didn't get it. I didn't get it 90 degree enough. Let's see if the other one is 90 degree enough. It isn't. It's very annoying trying to get a clean 90 degree cut there, but whatever. Gotta be careful with your fingers here, of course. There we go. Very hot now. And then we have our nano cord. The nano cord is power cord that's just micro. I don't remember the exact dimensions of this one, to be honest. Um, if I had my caliber close by, I could measure it, but maybe it says here 1.2 millimeter thick power um, nano cord. Each one of these I wrap here around the front. And right before we continue, I'm gonna get my little glue thing here. Oh, fuck this thing. It's always goddamn fucking stuck, I swear to God. Two things with super glue. Really, major safety issue having to for use your mouth to open these caps. Um, oh, nice, it still leaks. Another thing with super glue is that more than any other task in the world, using eye uh, protection when you're using glue like this, you, you know, it takes just a micro little freaking little thing of super glue in your eye and that's it you, know, you got a major fucking issue on your hands so definitely um you can grind without glasses you can forge without glasses you can shoot guns without glasses you can do anything you fucking want without glasses but when it comes to this kind of super glue thing you're you really do want to wear glasses because that is you can get a piece of metal in your eye and you're fine. You get a drop of fucking super glue in your eye and you're not fine. So that's just a, just a, just a observation there. And the fumes are also really intense. So when it comes to this part, I give myself a little bit of distance. Every single time I wrap this around, it's exactly the same. And I get it right up at the front. Shit, this thing can move away now. We don't need that. I usually have something else. Um, fuck, what's this here? I usually have something else under this, so... I don't want to get the moose. This is tabletop here. It's moose leather. We got on a hunting trip. I got a bit of glue there somehow. So we got to get that right there then I go around underneath over
Great, there was super glue on the tip of that. I've got it in my mouth. It's never happened before. It tastes fucking weird. So then, this is like <clears throat> where you want it to be super tight. <clears throat> I immediately stuck on my tongue. Now I got like a little spot on my tongue that's all fucking super glued. <clears throat> tastes fucking weird. So. You gotta be careful with this part. I like to, on the scalpels, I do this anyway. Um, on bigger knives, I do the whole entire length nano cord because the way that the power cord binds into that cr cross, the strings that are crossing is, is very, very strong. But with these scalpels, you don't really need that because they're not, you're not hacking with them. So you see I'm very, very tight. And I go four times around, you see? And on the fourth, so one, two, three, four, this is where I do the other knot. All right, but I do the knot on this side. Oh well. You do want this to be pretty tight. This is uh, important. Then you put your drops of glue here. You want to loosen it up a bit. You want that glue to go between the knot. Nice thing about super glue, especially this one. So, Bison Super Glue Liquid. Bison is the best brand I have so far found for all the power cord work. Bison Super Glue Industrial and Bison Liquid Control. Liquid Control is amazing. So is this uh, Industrial. Uh, it doesn't stain the power cord. Then I get my. Kisaki, and we cut the excess off. Like that. Oops. Got a little murky there. Like that. Cool. And that's... Um, acts as many things. So this keeps everything together here at the front. It also acts as a place to put glue for where we start the power cord. You can see that there's a ledge, that knot there, there's a ledge, prevents any forward movement. It prevents the, the rubber underneath this shrink tube from also uh, wanting to move over and move forwards. So this is actually a very, very important factor. And also on the final product, it, uh, because it lifts up this side of the power core knot here, that's basically your locking mechanism for the sheath. So it's, it's, it, it does, Kind of like three or four things, or five things at the same time. So there we have that. Now we find the center of your power cord string. I'm gonna move all this mess away. You wanna put it over, flatten it a little bit beforehand. Get your fingers under there. It's gonna be very difficult for me to explain everything I'm doing from this point on. But just not too much. You do need a certain amount, because if you do too little, then it doesn't do anything, actually. And then, you gotta be careful here as well. Just like that. Now, mind you, I have to do this with every single scalpel I've ever made. They've all gone through this process, so... You wanna make sure that your power cord goes over the, all the strings, right? You don't want any strings, you, you don't want any strings sticking out from, from, from in front of the first layer of power cord because it's very easy for something to kind of snag and then pull it out. So I see that a lot with on Instagram, other guys, other makers, they do these kind of handles and the, the strings are exposed. So now the glue has kept that there. Now the neat thing, you see this knot, this knot that's here, that's the one that goes underneath this, um, the first, the first, um, uh, Hiromaki, whatever, katana knot. So there was the first knot. So this is close to the katana method. The katana method, you reverse the knot direction on every, uh, every other one. But I'm not gonna do that because that's you know it's that's like extreme mastery level stuff and 
I don't want these, I don't want to put like, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to, <laughs> I'll do it on some night someday, but it's not, it's not all that necessary. So here you want to just kind of snug it up, push everything forwards. The biggest challenge you're going to have doing this power cord wrap is just making sure that everything is super tight on the spine and the, on the belly. So I'm going to put the cap here on this one. I don't like wearing goggles so much, so. All right. I'm gonna snuggle in. We're gonna do this. Now, you wanna make yourself a sheath that fits right over the blade. Because remember, these are like ultra sharp right now. These are super duper sharp. This is, uh, you know. So you gotta be careful with that. Except I can't put the sheath on until uh, we have a few knots down. So you put a lot of pressure as tight as you can and you pinch it really hard and you take your first one and you do two twists over like that. Right? And you take your other one. See? It's, it's going to take a little bit of learning to do. It's a lot of dexterity. One, two. Just like that. And then you use your fingers to kind of smudge everything in place. Remember, you got to push those knots forwards. You want to stack them as tight as you as you can. And then we go back to tightening them as tight as you can. So the nice thing with the katana wrap is that they have a tendency to um, they stay tightened. So as you're tightening this all the way down. That tension actually stays because it's just the nature of how the knots work is that they they sort of um, retain that tension they kind of keep themselves in place uh, so let's see how fast we can do this or the camera today see you want to really move that forward and take your time to make sure that you know the knots are nicely aligned and stuff and you got you don't have like weird folds anywhere just push everything forwards and then as tight as you can. After I do like a whole bunch of these, after, you know, in like a week, if I do like 30 or 40 or 50 or something in one go, your upper back gets pretty sore. So I'm just gonna get along and, oops. I don't know why these things are so much more difficult to do on camera. I, I don't know. God damn. So when I'm in my factory mode, I go pretty quick. You see two knot, two times over, two times over. It's a bit slow at first because I don't want to cut my fingers just like that. Uh, one of these power cords is a bit weird on me today. And I really want to stack those down. Push that knot to the middle. Just like that. Tighten it tight. And then go over two knots more. Just like that. God damn. I need to take this ring off. I'm having a some weird ass cramping going on in my hand. And the ring's not helping. Yeah, one of the reasons that uh, you really don't you want to wear glasses while you're doing the glue stuff is if when you're pulling tension and the glue hasn't solidified and you slip that string, you can splash some of that stuff around. And you don't want that. Like that super glue, you know, it's, I don't know, it's not as, it's it's pretty dangerous stuff once you think about it. And if you're going to expose yourself to it a lot, it's, it's just worthwhile wearing glasses. So you see, I've done this like a thousand times, you know. Uh... <laughs> 
the first, I actually took the picture away off my Instagram, but the first like five or six knives I ever put on Instagram were Karen bits with power cord handles like this. So I've been doing power cord wrapped handles for a very long time. Um, it's just kind of been my way, my go-to method. But what I noticed with the power cord handle is that it, it suits some designs and it doesn't suit others, you know? And I think after all the different knives that I've wrapped power cord handles to, the one that makes the most sense is the scalpel. <sighs> Gosh. You want to make it as tight as you want. You know, you feel it. This is rock hard, so that's a good sign. But I'll show you whenever I can. God damn. See, you really, this is the most important part right there. You see how well stacked that is? This is like, you really want to push them down. You really want to, you're really, you really want to do that. I used to use shrink tube that had glue inside, um, but the problem with that is that it had this. It was it was kind of soft and really tough at the same time, and it was way more difficult to actually have consistent knots and consistent pressure and consistent like product. It, it was much more. It required a, just a ton of strength to. Um, to, to get the power cord done right, so... Um, just the way it is. Now I can do this quickly because I've done this, you know, like a thousand times. Just in the scalpels alone, V1, V2, V3, you know, this is like close to number 500. So we're not including, you know, I've done with the entire rivet lock series, the longs, the mediums, the smalls, the picals, we're talking another, what, 200 knives? And that's just a couple series. So I had the Buckthorn, that was like 40 knives, 50 knives. There was the, um, what are there? There was the uh, uh, Cold Boys, that was like another 40, 50 knives. Um, so it took uh, quite a long time to get to this point. A lot of knives and a few kilometers of power cord. So, just because I can do it this fast and I make it look easy, it really doesn't mean that it is. Is it still recording yet? So, whoops. So, you know, 10 minutes to get here, that's quite a long time, especially when you have to apply a lot of pressure between each knot. So, but I think my favorite thing, really, one of my favorite things about making the scalpels is that it, it's a simplified process that's like highly focused around the things that I'm like quite good at. Oh, well, I mean, I guess that's the same with some of the other knives, but it's, you know, it doesn't, I don't get to, I don't have to sweat fucking hard all day when I'm making these. I can actually sit in front of the window here at my office and just uh, work on the handles. See, it's very difficult to get them that consistent like that. It's going to take you a few tries. I've had people come here, ask me to train them, and it took them four or five tries. Almost every one, it takes four or five tries where they do it and they redo it. And it takes, it's about the fourth or fifth time that they, they, they get it right. Or that it, it starts to look like they get it right. The difficult thing is, of course, when they're fucking left-handed or... Something like that, and, and, and or they have some weird thing where they just, they they can't do it with the same, hand, like, they, they don't use the same mechanics that I'm using with my hands, they have to do it in another way. 
uh, just because the nature of their dexterity is different and it's so difficult to kind of teach them. So you just have to, uh, just have to, just have to, but they get it, they get it. So eventually just make sure that these are rock hard. You want those knots to be as hard as possible. soon about time I should have you could yeah I could put the cover on the blade soon oh. yeah. just like that This is one of these things that a lot of people overcomplicate significantly. That's, that's one thing I noticed with a lot of knife makers is that they have a tendency to overcomplicate everything to justify feeling like they know better what they're doing. So they get all sorts of unnecessary jigs. They get all sorts of unnecessary tools. They get, and they do all these unnecessary extra steps, you know, to make what is essentially just a flat piece of metal with an edge on it. You know, that's what a knife is, you know, you gotta remember, like, a knife is, is just, is basically just a, see, there I have a bit of a weirdness, so I'm gonna go back and remove those knots and start fresh and redo that. That's something that you would probably not notice. But I notice it, so I have to correct it. There we go. Corrected. Like that. Somebody's calling me. You know what's really annoying nowadays? When people call, and you know maybe you're in the maybe you're in the garage or something or you're not by your phone it's a number you've never seen before you don't know who's calling and then they don't send a message afterwards telling you what's up like if you call somebody and they don't pick up send them a message say hey this is thomas hey this is mark you know hey this is celine dion I'm just calling you to ask about this and if you're this and this and this, you know? Like, otherwise they're never going to call back. Like, if people are so used to seeing messages from people they know with the names and everything attached that when some, you know, when you just see a random phone number, it's, you know, people are just like, I don't know, man, this is just too much to, is this a spam call? You know, these... These telephone salesmen have made it, like, have kind of ruined calling for everybody. It's kind of weird that in this day and age, we don't have any technology associated with actually, like, if you're calling a number you've never called before, there's no indicator as to, like, who's calling, right? You don't, you don't have your name anywhere. They can't see who you are. I mean, there's services on the internet. Okay, I'm going to put the sheath on. There's services on the internet. You can type the number and it's like, oh, it's this guy. But it's like, okay, well, why can't you just say that on the freaking call? It's like when, if you go to the doctor and the police and you go to all these different government institutions uh, and none of them have any idea... You have to fill in the same freaking form every single time like they've never met you before, even though like all your information is online. It's like, just, you know, it's like, just pick up, you know, I don't know. It's weird. So we're getting close to the end here, guys. Gotta make it tight. And then, uh, so the trick with this, and this is a trick that, um, this is a trick that is important with any and all types of power core knotting that you're doing. 
is that you're going to continue this process that we've been doing all the way up as far as you can go over this circle, over the hole. Don't stop it here. So the mistake a lot of guys do is they, they stop the hole here and they're like, well, how do I continue? How do I move on? How do I, you know, and they come up with all sorts of different things that don't work. The reason is, is because you want to continue doing the exact same process of these knots as far up above the hole as possible. That's the secret that nobody knows. That's the secret that, uh, that nobody knows. There we go. It's a bit of a tricky part, this one. I'm glad I managed to get this all in one take. I could probably do it faster, but usually what happens is I start quick and then I go I end up going slow because like my brain starts to wander off in all these thoughts and all this pondering. All the hot bitches I fumbled. Nah, just kidding. So you see I'm going over the hole. I'm going as far up as I can go with this process of the of the knots. Um, let's see. I keep it consistent. Yeah, I, I don't know why my brain is fogging up here. Sometimes you do something for so long, you've done it so many times, you forget how you do it. Because it's automatic. It's like all muscle memory. You see, I'm still doing that knot all the way up here until the end, right there. You see that? So I'm doing those knots to the end. And then I got my trusty, this is a modified tweezer. I've grounded it as thin as I can. Um, yeah, then you put these through. And that's why we have to make them pointy and st stiff. Kind of have to do them both at the same time. Ah, nuts. There we go. Those have to be really tight too. And uh, there's a little bit of flaring there. I'm just gonna burn that off because it's annoying. Burn it off after, of course, but. So now we want to cover all that steel. And the neat thing here is that by doing what all this is that you're actually locking the power cord in place here. So it prevents anything from sliding backwards. There we go. Like that. So we've gone around the end. And now you see this knot here. We bring those over and in there. So. Like that. Now if this was a bigger knife, so you see how by pulling it to the other side like that, the last katana wrap knot that we did over the hole, it's now locked in place, you see? It's being pulled through that hole. And that, of course, prevents anything from sliding back. And when you're doing power cord, um, any type of dimensional change where it gets bigger in one direction, it becomes more difficult for that power cord to slide in that direction. So that's why it's so important to have it. See how beautiful and tight that is on the, on the spine? That's how you want it. That is really like as tight as you can get it. It has to be, they basically have to be like 90 degree perpendicular to the profile of the blade. Just like this, you know, super, super tight. Um, yeah, so the next step is, of course, so um, 
generally with a bigger knife and a bigger hole, you go back and forth. So you go back through here over this one and you can kind of do all sorts of cool things and you can experiment with different types of knots. I'll have to show that on other videos, on other knives, but with this particular design, I found that all I need to do is pull this really hard all the way through and then give myself uh, like that. Gotta be careful here. Usually I have something soft underneath. I'll just put this freaking thing there. And I do my knot so it goes this way, that way, almost tight. You gotta be careful here. And then you get a nice fat glob of glue and you just pour it into that hole there. You want enough. And then you gotta be quick because it does settle. Ugh. And like that. Oops, shit. I forgot to put my glasses on. There we go. So, just like that. You can just uh, tap it a little bit. Maybe add a little bit more glue in there. And uh, that's your, that's it, pretty much. Like that. Get yourself a nice sharp knife. What am I cutting here? What's going on? Like that. Like that. And then what I like to do is just put this away. It's got a like a love-hate relationship with super glue. And then uh, just, I like to char the entire pommel down. Like that. It's got a little bit of a sharp corner here. I'm gonna melt that down a little bit. Nice, nice, and then after that, where's my tape? Get some tape. Is it still recording? Yeah, I'm surprised actually. Usually it doesn't record this long without crashing. And then I cover the blade. Ow, it's sharp. Like that. We get that super glue. And then what I do, and then I have a tool, another tool. I sort of uh, made a mess here last week. Where's my tool? Ah, come on. It's always on this table. It's always on this table. Well, I'll just use this one anyway. It's kind of annoying. It's like the basic tool that you always use and it's gone. So then, um, so on this side, I put glue here because this, this first knot here has a tendency to roll like that. So I pull it back like this and I put glue in there and I roll it right back over and that glue just kind of finishes all up. Now what I like to also do is put a bit of glue right above there and then I get my tool out and kind of just wash it in like that and just kind of spread it out. You gotta be careful here because you can easily just drop a massive glob of glue all over everything you've done and then you've kind of messed it all up. So here as well, I've got a nice little drop of glue. And then you just spread it out over there. And I, I don't know, for me this makes sense, but I haven't really, I don't really know why? I mean, maybe, you know, waterproofing a little bit the front. That's it. You know, nothing super special. I'm just kind of filling in all those gaps at the front of the blade with some super glue. 
and voila, we have ourselves um, the, the scalpel, HMK scalpel uh, version 3. This one is not actually as refined as some of the other ones. This was like done on video, so it's a bit difficult to do things on video, but it's very close. It's very, very nice one still. And uh, so you see we have a polished spine, nice steep uh, grind at 80 grit. So much, much, uh, very, very nice. Very, very nice. Every time I finish one of these, I look at it for a couple minutes and just think to myself, oh, that's so beautiful. How did, I, how did I come up with this? So the next thing is the sheath. The next thing is the sheath, which is actually super simple. So right next to where I wrap my handles, I have a vise here and I have an uh, oven here. I need to get a pizza stone inside because the, it's, it's, the, it retains heat. So it's a bit easier with, um, with the, it's a, a bit easier with consistency when it comes to the, to the power cord. And we just let that heat up. I only just stuck it on. And then we've got like foam pads like this, right? So this is the inner foam pad which is basically just duct tape all around. And then I sandwich that between a whole bunch of these like this. They wear out these pretty quick, so I have to replace them all the time. And uh, then I have my wooden, wooden clamps. Like this. And then I squeeze all that with the blade in the middle here in the vise, like that. So, we'll wait for this to heat up and then we'll give it a shot. All right, so I'll throw the Tridex in there. You gotta be careful, it doesn't melt. That happens quite a often. So, just let it be there. We get her. Oh shit, you know, I forgot something. I forgot something. I forgot something. I'm gonna take that out of there real quick. Um. What you first want to do is put a bit of shrink tube around the blade. Like that. Voila. Now we can put this one back in there. So you see that shrink tube will help us give a little bit of clearance inside the sheath so that we don't uh, scratch the blade when it goes in and out. It also allows you to sheath the blade if it's a little gunky. Otherwise, um, Otherwise you have to kind of clean the blade every time you want to put it back in. Sometimes you just don't have time for that. Or the sort of luxury to do it. Voila, like this. Just like that. Pretty good, huh? So this is a pretty clever trick. If some of you have been watching my videos, my prior videos, you'll see, uh, you'll see that trick. I recently learned that. It looks pretty soft, but maybe not soft enough just yet.
like that, like that, and then in the thing, nice and tight. Then you want to kind of push down on the blade, you want to push the spine into the sheath, and we let it settle there nice and tight for a little while. All right. All right. There we go. Just like that. So now I remove the scalpel out of the sheath. I leave the cover on while I'm in here, of course. And uh, of course, that somebody took the drill and never brought it back. So I'll be back in a second. All right. I'm glad that whoever takes the drill doesn't take the drill bit with them. So here's our classic little thing there. So. There's a couple places where I drill the holes. But I'll just throw that on the floor. There's a. This is my. So I do one quite close to the tip. Like that. And then uh, the distance, again, from here to the second eyelet is what actually creates the lock so the further up you dr uh, drill the second hole the further up the other eyelet is the tougher the lock is and uh, the thinner your material needs to be so I've found that somewhere around here is the best we want to be real close we want to get it nice and close to the edge there just like that. Then we get our trusty device uh, this way. So the nice thing with these sheets is they only really need two eyelets. And uh, yeah, this is a fourth generation shoe hammer. I use it for the eyelets and I use it for straightening blades. Nice. Next thing is I stuff an ear plug down there and that's to that's to um, block any dirt from going in while I'm cutting the excess off which generally happens here but uh, the fucking blade exploded on me last time so I'm gonna do it on the bigger grinder this uh, bandsaw is a million times more intimidating than the other one but I can't be bothered to change the blade. I don't know where the blades are. Um, so, for the other one, so, and it happened just last time I'm gonna make a video, so I'm just using this one. Then you see there's ridges. There's ridges, and I do the fourth ridge every time. I do the fourth ridge from the front.
Okay, that was the third ridge, but it's fine because it, all the V2s were the third ridge. I just made it a little longer for the V3s, but yeah, whatever. So now we go over to the bell grinder. It's a good time to turn on your heat gun. This one is an amazing heat gun. And now I just want to remove as much of the grind marks as possible, but also sort of any unnecessary mass uh, from her. And this is where this um, earplug comes in useful. like that. A lot of guys they do a rounded here but I don't like that because it just creates a place for dirt to fall into the sheath. I think this is much better because if you look on mine when you have it rounded there I can just pop it. I can I can put my thumb there right so I feel like it's better that way. Now we got our heat gun. We leave the Ear plug in there. degrees Celsius that damn Hitachi and it still takes a while oh my god just Get it. The earplug kind of absorbs some of that heat. So it doesn't take this long. It never takes this long. It's less than a minute to do this. Again, everything has to be so much more difficult on camera, you know? Everything is like always, the camera adds like an uh, extra degree of inconsistency. All right, so now we go back over and grab ourselves a piece of sandpaper and then we just round all the sharp corners. Apparently there are tools for polishing the um, Kydex, uh, the Kydex circumference like this, like on a buffing wheel kind of uh, thing, but like that.
And now's the time where you take, you just feel it a little bit, if there's any sharp corners, and you take that guy out. A little bit of air pressure, just to get rid of any BS in there. That's right. Looks good. Not bad. We remove the plastic from here. I sometimes I just run the edge like that and then it cuts itself right through. Just like that. And we have ourselves a finished scalpel. How about that? in all its glory. And we get our piece of paracord, which is half double arm length, somewhere around the middle here. Cut, like that. Then uh, just a knot. Like that. This is like the most expensive power cord, literally. <sighs> and voila, ladies and gentlemen. We have our power cord with the sheath. I mean, we have our HMK Scalpel version three, and you can buy these from my website or from Etsy, and there is going to be a coupon code at the bottom of this video for a 20% discount on Etsy. So it's Etsy, it's a YouTube love is the coupon code term. And here's our beautiful, beautiful, Scalpel version three. My most brilliant product or design, knife design so far that I've ever come up with. And here's the how to make video. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'll probably do the same exact kind of video more times, you know, I'll do uh, in the future. I'll just for fun, I'll do the video over and over again and kind of improve on it and uh, but there isn't really much more I can do other than just like more cinematic cool stuff and have a professional video photo videographer come here and, and do like a professional job really um, so Yeah, there it is guys in all its glory and I've done hundreds of these so you know, I started making knives like 20 years ago and So it's come a long way to get to this point and I have quite Yes, yeah, so here we have it, guys. Nice and finished. It's uh, been 20 years of knife making to get to this point where uh, I'm making these scalpel bees threes and I've made uh, almost 500 scalpels in total. So there it is. Here's a power cord. I'll just put this one on the necklace. The length of this power cord is half from here to there. Trying to make sure there's nothing suspicious on my windscreen, Win uh, my PC desktop computer. My background is Yoda, by the way. So there it is. There it is. And uh, if you want to support my work, you can get one of these from uh, my website or uh, Etsy. And there's a coupon code in the description um, for 20% off, which is YouTube love. And yeah, you know, here it is. You know, my personal one, I've been always, I've been carrying a scalpel V2, V1, V3 for the last five years or so. How, however long it's been since the first one was made and, uh, I use it more than anything else. I carry it with me everywhere. I don't really need any other type of knife. I mean, I don't see why I would need anything else. It's ultra light. I can have it under a shirt. It's unnoticeable. 
I can make a fire with it. Um, I can open all the boxes with it. Um, you know, I can cut stuff with it. <laughs> um, carve, do some fine intricate carving with it. Um, it's really, I haven't really needed to, I haven't really needed any other knife, really, other than the Pical, this one. This is my other EDC. Um, but it's just the blade shape. So if you want to support my work, you can go ahead and uh, visit my website or visit Epsi and use the YouTube Love coupon code. And, uh, Get yourself one of these scalpel V3s, and uh, I'll be making more of these videos later. I'll, I'll, I'll like redo this V3 video. I'll make like how to make a V3, how to make a scalpel video over and over again. You know when I'm bored. They don't take super long to make these videos because the it only takes it doesn't take all that long to make a scalpel. Um, I've honed down the process pretty well, so. Yeah. See you guys later.